David, a COVID vaccine may be coming soon, but it needs to be kept super cold in a cold chain. How are we going to get it to people? John, I have no clue. Luckily, Professor Anna Nagurney, who's right here on our show, studies this for a living, and she's going to tell us all about it. Welcome to Care Talk, your ice cold home for incisive debate about healthcare business and quality. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrix. Hey, John, we have a guest on the show today since I know you know everything about uh, you know supply chain and cold chain, but I thought just, just in case we'd have somebody on. Who, who do we have here, John? Well, Anna Nagurney is one of the experts on one of the hardest problems we have in, in a world where everybody's thinking about invention of the vaccines and the strategy there, there aren't enough people thinking about how to distribute it. And it's actually pretty complicated. And Anna's going to help us there. As, as Napoleon once said, you know, armchair generals talk about strategy, real generals talk about logistics. And as you think about, you know, billions of doses, hundreds of millions, even, even for the frontline folks in most developed and undeveloped worlds, suddenly logistics, after you've invented the bio, you've got the biology and the manufacturing right, um, is going to be the biggest challenge. And so thinking about that right now and understanding it is one of Anna's specialties. Well, great. Well, John, it sounds like you're on board with uh, bringing in a guest. So that's uh, that's always good. So Anna, you're the John F. Smith Memorial Professor and Director of the Virtual Center for Super Networks at UMass Amherst. I know what all that other stuff is, except what are super networks and what, what are you studying there? Thank you, David. Super networks are networks of networks. So how the internet would interact with financial networks, supply chains, uh, how transportation networks interact with logistical networks, and so on. So we don't just do a particular network system, but we're interested in the interaction among different kinds of network systems. So supply chains are a perfect example. And you've got some uh, great new uh, publications about just the topic we are interested in. And, and we'll want to talk today about COVID-19 vaccines. And there's these new vaccines, at least the first couple, that need to be kept super cold. And one's like minus four degrees and one's minus 94 degrees. So wh what's going on? Why, why do they need to be kept at these temperatures? And is this a feature of all the vaccines or just these RNA-based vaccines? And what are, we, what are we looking at here? That is a feature just of these new vaccines that are mRNA-based, uh, so specifically the Moderna vaccine and also the Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna vaccine needs to be kept at minus 4 Fahrenheit, whereas the Pfizer is really a deep freeze kind of vaccine and uh, needs to be kept at minus 94 degrees. And there are obviously other ones, too, uh, that are still part of the cold chain. You can't get away from the cold chain, but we have the ones that are below freezing point and then the ones are, that are just in the regular kind of cold chain, typically like uh, two to eight degrees centigrade. So while there's at least, I think, Anna, 300-ish vaccines in development, the vast majority of them, I think 70 or 80 percent of them are in that, have, have, have leaned, and certainly the ones that are showing most promise, are using that mRNA channel without getting too much into that. What that would mean is that if the majority of the scientists are right, and that is the approach we take, or there are a couple of others that are also cold chain, and by cold chain, it means we have to have, we have to deliver the dose from manufacturing to patient in a secure, stable uh, way that is temperature controlled, uh, that, that your expertise is going to be absolutely essential. But aren't we at the stage right now where rather than a, a super network for vaccine delivery, for this kind of a volume and complexity, isn't it sort of an imaginary super network we have to then cr cr build behind in order to deliver You know what, what will effectively be billions of doses to protect, the, protect, protect, uh, uh, protect our species against this horrible, nasty virus? Yeah, it's going to involve a lot of cooperation uh, among logistics providers, the manufacturers, uh, private public partnerships, and also uh, obviously the federal government in terms of distribution. And one of the things that's so challenging is these mRNA vaccines. They are ensconced essentially in a lipid nanoparticle, so that's a fat. 
And if fat warms up, okay, it disintegrates, it melts, and that, that's one of the problems. And the thing is you want to make sure that they're maintained at the proper temperature because otherwise the quality deteriorates. And also what might happen in these deep freeze vaccines is that you might even get bacterial contamination, and that would be very, very troublesome. And that's something people aren't even talking about, and we do a lot of research on quality. And uh, the thing is it, we can't be wasting these vaccines. They're so valuable that if the quality deteriorates, uh, people won't get inoculated, uh, we won't be able to protect our population, and then we'll have to continue inoculating them because they didn't get the right vaccine, you know. It wasn't high quality. So, you know, we're talking about safety here, we're talking about security, we're talking also about effectiveness. Uh, this is a global challenge. There's never been a, such a big logistical challenge in such a short time frame, too. That's something else that people aren't talking much about. You know, we really need to deliver them in a timely manner. And because once you open up some of these vaccines, they're going to perish fairly quickly and you can't have that happen. So just the logistics of scheduling patients is going to be uh, a major, major hurdle. Do we have, do we have the infrastructure today to just thinking about the U S to actually, if, if, if David, comes out of his basement with and his family have created a new mRNA vaccine that's this, that, 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 is, that is encased in that lipid. John, you're not supposed to tell people about that, but go on. And we could, and we could manufacture it at scale. Let's say do a couple hundred million doses. Do t Tomorrow, could we, do we have the infrastructure to deliver it securely to the American people? I think that's something that's still undetermined. Obviously, it's going to take a, a longer horizon. You can't do it all instantaneously. Also, you need the human resources that are able to actually inject this vaccine. You know, and we see a portfolio of vaccines probably coming out, and we're not sure right now, you know, even which one is going to win out. So there's so many uncertainties, but the infrastructure needs to be worked on. That's something that's imperative. And typically there aren't many places that will be able to handle these, you know, very cold kinds of temperatures. And once you open up even the shippers that Pfizer is providing, uh, you still are going to have to maintain them with dry ice. You have to be very, very careful uh, you can't keep them open long. Uh, also, the packaging is another issue. It looks as though like Moderna's might have 10 doses within a certain vial. So, you know, there are, you know, not just the big supply chain issues, but also kind of the more disaggregated micro supply issues as well. So basically, you're going to have to get uh, a group of 10 buddies together to go and get the vaccine and make sure none of us have COVID so we don't get COVID on the way there. But I got a stupid question. John usually asks the stupid questions. But my stupid question is, if the thing is so darn cold, I'm going to freeze my arm off when I when I get injected. Is that going to happen? Uh, no, because they actually will be thawing it out, but they can't thaw it out for a long period of time. Okay, and it has to be used typically within about six hours. So I have a feeling they're going to be running, you know, these inoculation injection sites twenty four seven. That's really the way to do it. And does that mean, really, Anna, that what's likely to happen is that all of these will be based around hospitals that would have at least theoretically the physical and human infrastructure? to actually serve and actually control it because there's that you know you could actually see if if covid's running hot a surge of people either wanting to get it or not wanting to get it you need security sort of at both ends both at distribution uh, sort of sort of storage and then delivery Exactly. Yeah. Hospitals will be major centers as injection sites. I can see maybe some military installations as well, which people aren't talking about. But when it comes to pharmacies, probably the major chains will be able to handle it. Uh, what I'm really concerned about is rural areas. Okay, If you get bigger shipments, they'll have to probably break up the shipments. Who's going to be delivering them to points of demand? Uh, luckily, some of the vaccine manufacturers are starting actually facilities in the U.S. That's going to be really, really critical. Uh, the last mile deliveries in terms of trucks, for example. But, you know, other vaccines, uh, for example, AstraZeneca's will probably be manufactured in India. 
So about 50%, we think that uh, of the vaccines will be maybe transportable via trucks, via land, but probably about 50%, it's going to involve global air shipments. And that's something else, which is a major issue. You know, the air cargo capacity has been reduced. So it's almost like every link in these distribution networks has been affected because of the pandemic. And on top of that, you have these extreme challenges because of the cold chain and the packaging. So Anna, you don't, you sound a little frustrated. Tell us a little bit about what we should be worried about or what we should be demanding of policymakers right now. Because because we certainly, all, all of us should be able to, to push for the, the 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 infrastructure we want to see, if if the if vaccines are going to save us, we absolutely need to figure out how to distribute them. What are what are the biggest challenges you see? Well, right now we are supposed to have some more centralized control, but that's not really clear. Obviously, Health and Human Services is working with the Department of Defense, also working with McKesson, their pharmaceutical uh, wholesaler. Now we're thinking CVS might also be involved, uh, but you, you need more centralized control, uh, more transparency. But at the same time, obviously, we don't want to reveal too much because it's a security issue as well. If you find out exactly where, you know, uh, the vaccines are going to be manufactured, who exactly is going to be transporting them and when, well, you can think of all sorts of scenarios, right, obviously, in terms of security. And we've and, and that security isn't just physical security. There's also already been some 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 activity around foreign actors. Russia and Iran called out most recently in the intelligence community at the, potentially figuring out how to target and disrupt exactly what you're trying to solve for. I mean, I, I would imagine how would they do that? What do we need to harden and protect against? We need to protect the manufacturing facilities, the storage facilities. I would also say uh, some of the suppliers, even of the glass files, the injections, um, even the stoppers, everything is really important. And also, obviously, the special packaging for the vials, they'll be needed in the cold chain and, you know, like Pfizer's vaccine. But they're also working. So you need more like centralized control so you can track. John gets right into spooky world right away, but how, how about the fact that, uh, you know, I think last I saw most of the refrigerators need electricity, which we don't always have uh, in California. And then I think if you, you're talking about kind of, you know, central um, coordination and planning, and I, I know you've written also about, what, what, John, what did I do now? I see. Massachusetts looking down on California yet again. You're just upset that you've got a big winner. Yeah, that's that's it. I got to protect the I got to protect the, the fridges in my basement, John. Now that I know I have, I know I'm making all the vaccine, but I know, I know I got I know I got to put it in the fridge or the freezer. I got I got to talk to my wife about it, if we can clear some stuff out. But there's there's issues with power, and then I think you know you've also Anna studied what's going on with the the personal protective equipment, which I thought you know back in March that was an issue, and it still seems to be an issue. So are, are we are we just fooling ourselves to be able to you know to take this approach? Is it masks forever? Uh, we will see. It will take a while. I'm confident in our scientific expertise. I really believe in uh, the medical doctors. I believe that we will scale up our manufacturing capabilities, uh, do more in-house uh, production, uh, minimize the outsourcing of essential medical supplies, and that includes PPEs. Okay, we can do it. I mean, we got, you know, men on the moon. We had the Manhattan Project. This is the kind of scale of scientific endeavor that we really need to all channel our resources, you know, together to accomplish this. So do you really think we're doing it right right now, Anna? Or do you, or do you, or do you feel that we're focusing too much on the, the, the sort of the vaccine race? The, the derby, the who's ahead this week, who's ahead that week. Let's have another press release and maybe the price, our, our, our pharma, our publicly traded price will go up as a pharma company. Uh, I mean, I, it just feels to me like this this essential issue, again, armchair versus reality, that it's kind of all about the ability to, to deliver the goods in a safe way, particularly in an environment when people are, you know, they're, they're, there's a real fear of people being anti-vaccine. I just, I, I just, I'm not, I'm not, um, and how would we re, how would we refocus attention on this and where should it be? 
Well, I think we need to publicize. That's why you do things like write, and that's why you have a podcast. I think that's extremely important, and people are starting to listen. I get contacted every day by even entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, startup companies from multiple continents uh, saying, well, we want to help. Can you be the intermediary? I, I mean... You know, I'm not a legislator. I, you know, I don't really have the power, but I can at least share knowledge and communicate, and that's extremely important. And now it seems that uh, some of the vaccines that are winning the race in terms of manufacturing, like the mRNA-based ones, are actually the ones that you can manufacture more quickly, but they're much more complicated when it comes to the distribution. Whereas, for example, uh, Johnson & Johnson's um, uh, actually, and also AstraZeneca's, it takes longer to produce, but it's easier to distribute. And also, we haven't even been talking about the fact that uh, the mRNA vaccines and some of the others will require double the dosage, too. So that doubles the time you know, to protect people, and that duplicates the logistical needs as well. Well, Anna, my, my, I was thinking about that, too. I, I'm the simple one here, as you may have figured out. And the uh, my simple thing is, I know that my own doctor's office is, you know, they're terrific, but uh, what's the chance that when I go for my second shot, I'm going to get the same one, or I'm just going to get like the first dose of one thing and the first dose of something else? I mean, I could, I'm not sure they could attract that. You can't do that. I mean, that will really create problems. So yeah. that's something else, you know, the traceability, the tracking, very, very important, keeping everything straight. So again, you need the human resource, you need the technology to support that as well. You know, do we have that? They're working on it, but I don't see it being ready yet, and definitely not by the end of October. Yeah, David, you've got to start going to a licensed doctor because no, 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 no licensed doctor is going to allow you to take one dose from one and one dose from another. That's just a weird question, dude. The kitchen sink, right? Treatment that we are hearing about. Yeah, well, I got. I'll get my remdesivir there too. Well, the thing is, John, you know, I was, I was, and, and, and I was, I was very excited about this discussion because I, I, my feeling going into it was that, you know, on my way to vote, I was going to go and get my, my vaccine, which I, I was told was going to be ready and it'll be, be all that it'll be all be protected and be all set. But now I guess I'm, I'm hearing something else. Get your flu shot, David. It's not, the vaccine's not ready. Exactly. <laughs> And there's some shortages already of flu shot around the world and even in parts of the U.S. So, so, so as we think about this, Anna, and you, if you had, if you had one thing to tell legislators, the the you know the the, uh, the Senate Health Committee or the or the, or the House Equivalent Committee or the uh, don't don't call the White House, they're busy. Uh, but if you could talk to legislators right now, what would what would the message be? Emphasize logistics and also support the hospitals. Okay, uh, the healthcare centers, the doctors that will actually be giving the shots because they're not paying for that. That's going to be very, very costly. They're not paying. There's no reimbursement plan. No, that's crazy. When the the president, who who David just just looked up to so greatly, um, tells us that he, the army is going to take care of this, and there's a and they, they and the army is good at centralized logistics. To your point, and they are secure. What's your level of confidence that they're working on these issues as they're trying to kind of obviously manage a bunch of other things? In the spring, I teach a course on humanitarian logistics and healthcare, and I always bring invited speakers. I'll be doing it via Zoom next semester from the National Guard, from the military, you name it. It's fantastic. I do trust that they have the expertise uh, and the willingness to do that, and I think we may end up having to actually use them. Well, that's that's encouraging because at least we've got that figured out. Good. Well, this has been. I don't think I can handle any more negative news for today, and so I think we should uh, we should we should declare victory and uh, and 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 move on. And I want I want to thank our, our guest Anna Nagurney, John F. Smith Memorial Professor and Director of the Virtual Center for Super Networks at UMass uh, Amherst. I'm David Williams, President of Health Business Group. Thank you, Anna, and I'm Don Driscoll, the CEO of Care Centrics. Thanks for listening.